So welcome everyone. My name is uh, Rinka Gupta. I am from Argonne National Lab, as David said. And today I will be talking about Agile methods. So just a brief outline. We'll first talk about Agile methods, especially in the context of small teams. I'll, I'll talk about what Agile is, what is the terminology, what are the approaches we follow and basic methods uh, to actually get started with it. So let's spend a few seconds first talking about small teams. Small teams, as the name says, are, are usually small. They usually have one senior faculty member or a PI and several junior members who may be postdocs or other students, depending on the environment. Uh, the roles of the senior and the junior staff differ, differ significantly. A senior staff provides stable presence they are going to be around in the team for a really long time, sometimes for the entire length of their career. The junior staff may be there for a shorter period of time uh, until they complete their education. Maybe they may come and go more frequently. The senior staff are the ones who actually provide the vision and understand the broad picture well, but they rarely have the time to do the actual coding. It's the junior staff that actually uh, do the code writing and know the lower level details. So usually small teams have informal structures and less clearly defined processes in place. And anyways, the workflow processes that exist for really large team or enterprise environments, they are uh, probably too heavyweight and often uh, not necessary for small teams. Uh, in addition to this, there are uh, there are other challenges that small teams face, right? There is usually a constant influx of people and you have to ensure that uh, newcomers, they ramp up quickly so that they are able to contribute quickly. And when, when they are done, when they're ready to depart, then the challenge is to retain all the information that they have garnered. Because as I said, they're usually the ones working on the lower, lower level aspects of the code. So there are definitely a lot of challenges that uh, small teams face. Uh, you know, a, a typical research team member's life cycle is uh, shown in the slide here. So when a team member joins, uh, there is uh, some in, you know, initial phase uh, where they, uh, they integrate with the team, they identify project activities and so on. And then the team member starts ramping up, understanding the project better. Now the ramp up phase and the ramp up time depends on how effective the team's ramp up processes and how much experience the new, new team member has. And of course it can vary considerably. The, the next phase is when the team member is actively working and that you see when it's you know, in the ongoing planning part of this life cycle. And uh, they are actually working, they are contributing, they are writing code. And then when they are ready to exit, uh, there should always, always be a ramp down path. Usually when it's a student or a postdoc, one has a good idea of when they are exiting. So there's an opportunity to train the replacement member and to uh, capture their contributions. Uh, once they depart, uh, the new, new, you know, a new team member joins in and then the cycle is repeated. So of course, as I mentioned, there are a lot of challenges and one way to deal with some of these challenges is to have checklists and policies in place. Checklists are essentially to-do lists. And on this slide on the right-hand side in, is an example of a new developer checklist from the Trillionos project, a scientific project. And it's basically an onboarding checklist for new members. Having checklists is good because you're essentially documenting the process. And if you are missing something in the process, then you, um, then you simply go ahead, improve your checklist, and then automatically your process gets improved for the next time. Now, what kind of checklist do you need? Uh, that is totally dependent on you and your team. You can have onboarding checklists, offboarding checklists, but you can also have checklists for code development, code development or code reviews or testing. So it's up to your discretion as to what kind of checklist you want. Uh, another way to maintain consistency is basically by having something called as policies. And there's a URL out here which points to the XSDK project, uh, which has, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big math project and um, 
It has several community policies, uh, and these policies ensure consistency not only within one project, but across the entire area, you know, and, and, and across the entire array of uh, math library projects. So now let's talk about Agile and see why it works for small teams, uh, especially in the scientific domain. Uh, when you're working in, in scientific research teams, you really don't know when you will have a breakthrough. And when you have a breakthrough, uh, your, work per, your work pattern actually drastically changes. So having really heavyweight techniques and approaches are not really conducive for the scientific uh, for, for the scientific domain. And uh, now with Agile, if you have a small team, you can uh, you can you can pick and choose as to what kind of processes you really want to adopt. So Agile works really well for small teams. You can choose what is meaningful for your team, what promotes uh, you know productivity, what is improving communication in your team. So instead of adopting a wide array of processes that are probably not beneficial to you, but which others use, you can actually choose what you really want. So what exactly is Agile and what is, what is not Agile? What, you know, there's, there's some confusion sometimes about that. So let's talk a bit, bit about that. Agile is not a software development life cycle. It is not like the waterfall model or an iterative model. It does not have different phases that a conventional software development life, life cycle model has. And many times I've noticed that, you know, when people do sloppy work uh, and they say that they are following agile method, if they're not writing documentation, they say, I don't write documentation. I don't do formal requirements because I'm, you know, I'm following the agile method. Well, agile is definitely not an excuse for, uh, non-systematic or sloppy work. Uh, that's definitely not acceptable. And, and then there are, uh, there's this other class of people who, uh, who consider Agile to be synonymous with Scrum. Uh, as, you, as some of you might know, Scrum is a framework that helps work, teams work together. It's very widely used in the enterprise industry. And, and Scrum is, is a very useful tool. It is definitely Agile, but Agile is not just Scrum. There are, uh, other Agile methods that exist and Scrum is uh, just one of them. And, and speaking of Scrum, as I said, Scrum is definitely a very good framework for people who use it, but its applicability in the scientific team has not been explored much. And people definitely prefer something called Kanban uh, a, a lot more, uh, which we'll talk about in one of the later slides. So to understand what Agile really is, uh, you should really go to this website called agilemanifesto.org and read the manifesto. The manifesto has uh, four critical components that you see written right above this red box. Uh, the first component is, says that individual and interactions are more important than processes and tool. Uh, the second component says that working software is more important over comprehensive documentation. Now, this does not mean that one can use Agile as an excuse for not writing documentation. That should not be the case because, you know, if you see right under this four stick critical component statements is a red box that's highlighted. And the red box says that while there is value in the items on the right hand side, we value the items on the left mode, which means that if the statement is working software over comprehensive documentation, it means that comprehensive documentation is important, but working software is much more valued in the Agile world. So, so now if you're like serious about Agile, it's a good idea to take a look at the Agile manifesto, these four main components, and Agile has 12 principles. So it's good to look at the 12 principles as well. So this slide and perhaps the next one show, uh, shows the 12 principles that are a part of the Agile Manifesto. And uh, we don't have the time to go through all the 12 principles. So I'll just touch maybe one or two. Uh, the first principle says that our highest priority is to satisfy the customer through early and continuous delivery of valuable software. This principle is important because this is actually what Agile focuses on mainly. You know, when you are implementing software, the software should be given to stakeholders early and as frequently as needed. 
Uh, this is because a lot of uh, other you know, software development lifecycle processes, they sometimes use need a lot of time investment for designing, implementing, testing the software. And eventually after following that entire cycle, when a software is ready, a lot of time has passed and requirements have changed and target environments have changed. And there's a lot of force fitting that goes on to get the software working for the stakeholders. So Agile tries to circumvent this by saying that have the software out to the customers as early as you can, as frequently as you can. The Agile Manifesto's second principle is also important. It says we welcome changing requirements, even late in development. So Agile supports changing develop, uh, requirements, but that doesn't mean that a stakeholder can just walk in and say every day that, hey, here are my new requirements. Uh, it's, it's important that Agile offer a way to change requirements uh, because it again goes to the first point where you know as time passes during code, code development, the requirements change and, the, and there needs to be a good way to get these uh, requirements into the code. So if you're interested, uh, take a look at this next slide as well. A lot of items out here are highlighted in red, such as Agile's focus on um, sustainable development or uh, the team reflecting on how to become more effective. These are all ex excellent principles and worth reading if you are serious about Agile. So one thing I want to point out is that uh, about the 12 principles of Agile is that none of the principles are hard and fast rules. The basic philosophy is that instead of uh, following a rigid framework that is ill-fitting, and that if followed for a long period of time may ultimately lead to frustration or failure, it may be good to investigate some of the agile practices and adopt them if suitable. So one way to adopt a few agile practices is you pick up a practice step with your team, see what resonates with your team, try out that practice for some time. And if it works great, if not, then try something else. At this point, I really want to mention Kanban again because it has worked for a lot of scientific teams. And hence, we do think that Kan Kanban is a good uh, starting framework. You can, you can start with the following the basic principles of Kanban, which we'll discuss in some time. And then you can add practices whenever you think they are, uh, or they are, you know, whenever you think you need better practices. And this is perhaps better, as I said, like instead of using Scrum and then trying to force fit it, removing Scrum features that you don't need, it's perhaps easier to get started with something like Kanban and, and then build on it incrementally. Talking about Kanban, here, here the slide shows you a basic Kanban board. When I think of Kanban in very layman terms, I think of it as a very sophisticated to-do list. And if all, if all the tasks in my head for my projects were translated onto a board, it would look pretty much like what you are seeing on the slide. Every scientific project essentially has tasks that can be segregated into columns like the ones you see on the board. You, you will always have backlog of items. You will have items that are ready to go, items that are in progress, items that are done or have been accomplished. And you can have other columns as well, you know, ready for development or items in review. So the scope of you know, having whatever columns you think are needed for your project, you can be as creative as you want. And we've seen, uh, uh, people, students being creative by having columns called as uh, waiting for advisor confirmation or a blocked waiting on feedback from advisor and so on. So it's up to you as to how you want to design your uh, Kanban board. Kanban does have a few basic principles that we, you know, we recommend you follow. For example, one of the principles is that you limit the number of tasks in the in progress column. The in progress call a column named in progress plays an important role on a Kanban board. It means that these are the tasks that you are working on actively. And of course, the tasks are specific to each team, but uh, sometimes the recommendation is that you have two N minus one tasks, where N is the number of team members. And having such principles is good because if you have too many tasks, then your team members are going to spend a lot of time context switching instead of making progress. Uh, so you have to optimize flexibility versus context switching overhead. 
and uh, ensuring that your team members don't become overcommitted. So things of this sort become easier to address when you have certain when you have certain rules assigned to your in progress column. Uh, one beauty of Kanban board is that it's very good at exposing bottlenecks, especially when it comes to productivity. For example, if you have a column named blocked where you're waiting for feedback from external collaborators, and if that column is full, then you know where the bottleneck is. And the bottleneck is basically not getting timely input from collaborators. And once the bottleneck is identified, it's, it becomes easier to fix. And, and, and so Kanban does offer you know, beautiful flexibility and is therefore quite effective in R&D settings because it avoids a deadline-based approach as compared to other tools like Scrum. And it's a nice and elegant way of viewing your task, managing issues, ensuring that you are making progress. So this slide out here is, is, uh, talks about personal Kanban. And it says that the Kanban principles are not just for your work life, but they, are, they can very much be applied to your personal life as well in exactly the same way. In fact, I use Kanban principle to manage aspects of my personal life on a daily basis. Uh, there's a very nice book referenced here that you can read if you're inclined about how to do personal Kanban. And I also want to reference the Better Scientific Software website that is bssw.io, which has a lot of articles on individual productivity, team productivity, using Kanban for productivity, and so on, a resource worth checking out. So now we've learned some of the theory you know, behind Kanban, but how do we actually use it? Creating a Kanban board is very simple. It's basically a set of columns put together, and then you can define the columns, you can add your tasks, give column names and definitions. So how, what, are the, you know, what are the tools you can use to actually start putting the theory into practice? You can use your wall, you can use post-its, you can use you know, white boards to draw this Kanban boards, black boards. This is the basic approach. If you want to get started right now, this minute, this approach is something you can just pick up. But in addition to these basic approaches, there are, there's a lot of software available for Kanban. For example, there's Trello, there's Jira. Uh, if you want, you can use GitHub. GitHub lets you create issues and project boards. And project boards are basically Kanban boards. Uh, in my personal life, I use Trello. There is a free version of Trello, a paid version. It's a, it's a software that you can use for Android, iPhone, iPad. And I create a board for myself and share it with family members. So there are definitely a lot of tools for you to get started if you want to start playing around and see where you go. So one uh, question that gets asked many times is how many tasks do you have on your Kanban board overall? There is no right or wrong answer for this. When I started, I used to have like three tasks on my Kanban board. And now on an average, I have like 15 to 20. And you know, the freeway traffic analogy is very applicable here. And you ask the question, does the traffic on the freeway really flow fast and best when there are a lot of cars? And the answer is no. So the same thing is true for your effectiveness. If you have a bowl full of tasks, it doesn't mean that you're going to be more productive. That's something to keep in mind when you are adding tasks to your Kanban board. Uh, one point to note is that you, one may get started with Kanban boards with a lot of enthusiasm, but you need to make it a habit to go and spend time looking at the board, consulting the board. The board will bring into focus how well your team is progressing, what the bottlenecks are, how much free time you know, uh, your team is having. It will enable, uh, enable reflection and retrospection. It will help you improve productivity if you use the board sensibly and regularly. And even if you drop the habit and don't look at the board for a long time, which I've done many times before, uh, sometimes it's, it's okay. You can stop and then go back and reanalyze the board and restart the habit. So again, let's talk a bit about the importance of in-progress concept. In our audience, we have students, we may have young professionals who are just starting their career and they wonder if the Kanban is of any, of any use to them. And the answer is yes. If you have your Kanban board, you can clearly see what items are in progress. And let's say you're working uh, with, your, with your PhD professor, professor or your PI, and you have a lot of tasks, but a new something new and exciting comes along. 
if you have something systematic, if you have a systematic Kanban board, you will have a clear picture of whether you have the time and bandwidth to actually accept the task and to execute it properly. If your in progress column is very full, then you may not have the bandwidth to, to start a new task. And then you are in a position to talk to your manager, to talk to your advisor and, and negotiate and see if some tasks can be put on the back burner so that you can start the new task. You know, uh, sometimes one thing that these things are easy to do with a simple to-do list, but uh, when you try out Kanban boards, you will realize the, the immense power it has over, over, over very simple, naive to-do lists. 